Good morning. <laughs> this is where we stayed last night, by the way. One of these pod things. Stayed for the dark skies, but we just had cloud and it's still cloud today. A little bit of hill fog, but not so bad on the bottom. Um, today we're going to be doing section 19 of the Grand Tour of Northumberland. Um, more artwork and some history as well on this one and a legend of Northumberland. So, join us for section 19. Digging through the closet, walled cities Past lives and boxes Music to talk till it seep from my skin Can't stand to hear it This here is Kielda Castle. It was built in 1775 as a hunting lodge for the Duke of Northumberland. It was rebuilt around 1867 and was sold to the Forestry Commission in 1932. As you would expect, there is a legend of Northumberland associated with Kielda, called the Count of Kielda. The Count of Kielda is said to have been Sir Richard Newt. He lived in the 13th century and was Sheriff of Northumberland. He is said to have been a giant of a man. One day he was hunting north of his castle along the Scottish border near Kielda Stone, a large natural boulder on the moors. Though most people would associate his castle as being Kielda Castle, We've already established that Kielda Castle was actually a hunting lodge of the 18th century, rebuilt in the 19th century, so it wasn't the current castle. However, there are the ruins of a castle in Kielda Forest called Cursope Castle. Unfortunately, the Grand Tour doesn't go in that direction. So, Sir Richard went hunting around the Kielda Stone. Now, it's said that if you travel three times around the Kielda Stone clockwise, it will change your look. Count and his men proceeded to do just that while making a lot of noise with their hunting horns. Enough noise to wake up the brown man of the moors. One of the fair folk who in a foul mood cursed the Count. The Count was unworried as he wore a magic armour warded with rowan leaves to protect against witchcraft and the fair folk. As he left the stone to continue the hunt he happened on Lord Sulis and his men who invited the Count to dine with him at Hermitage Castle in Scotland. Now Lord Sulis had a fearsome reputation for witchcraft and kept a red cap, one of the fair folk with evil magic, a kind of dwarf whose cap must be kept red with blood. But despite knowing the tales, the Count did not fear with his armour warded against such villainy. A banquet was laid out at the castle for the Count and his men, but as they were eaten, the Count noticed Sulis did not partake, and then his men were plunged into darkness and paralysed in their seats. The Count, protected from magic, was able to escape, but his men were not so fortunate. Sulis and his men gave pursuit, but the Count, in his magic armour, taunted them, only for the Red Cap to advise his lord to force the Count into the river, but the Count's armour acted against him. The Count fell into a deep pool, and his armour dragged him to the bottom and drowned him. The Count's body can still be found in a large grave at Hermitage Castle. This here is another artwork, it's a minotaur 
It was designed by artist Shona Kitchen and architect Nick Coombe in response to the old Castle Garden site. The maze deliberately uses a rugged walling system comprised of gabions to suggest a certain dark purpose and strength and a room of glittering glass to offer a delicate goal for our visitors must find. The structure plays with the notion of traditional building deconstructing it so that usual features such as walls, doors, windows and stairs still exist but not necessarily where you might expect to find them. The guide says this is supposed to be a quiet place to contemplate. <laughs> I don't think so. Right, let's get back out if we can. There's Neil. He's lost. <laughs> You're going the wrong way, by the way. You're going for the glass thing. So you need to, if you go back to the start, but instead of turning the way you did, turn the opposite direction. All right. If you reckon, go ahead. We'll just leave Neil in the maze, trying to find his way out. This here is Kielda Salmon Center. I see the young salmon. It is the largest hatchery of wild salmon in England. That was a very interesting place, definitely worth a visit. Apparently they stock 160,000 salmon every year into the River Tyne and they also do sea trout and freshwater mussels. Kielder village is reputedly the most remote village in England. Although I'm not quite sure how they work that out, but apparently it is. This here is Silvus Capitalis. It was designed by a group of people called Simpoch. The head has been conceived as a watcher, an imaginary presence who has observed the passing occupation of the landscape over past millennia, and who has also seen how environment has dramatically changed during the last 100 years. Members of Simpoch worked throughout February and May 2009 to fabricate and construct a head in the forest from approximately 3,000 specially shaped pieces of European larch, which have been glued and pegged together without the use of any screws or nails. Visitors to the head who enter through the mouth and climb upstairs to look out its, of its eyes literally get inside its head. The next piece of artwork is quite close to the head. This one's called Viewpoints. It looks like the viewpoints on a OS map. It's by Tania Kovacs. It was built in 1998. Originally two viewpoints sat on opposite shores, visible from either side, but remote destinations. Only the north viewpoint at Needs Hill is now still in place. Viewpoints is a physical three-dimensional representation of the Ordnance Survey symbol for a viewpoint, and as such, this sculpture references existing ideas of what makes a picturesque view, offering a frame for the landscape and encouraging the visitor to consider the experience of looking. And that is the view. It also looks like half a pack of Gary Lee. <laughs> it does look like half a pack of dairy league. You're right, Neil. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Neil's just asked me, did I consider the view? And yes, I did consider the view. Personally, I don't think this is the best view on Kielder. We had some really nice ones yesterday, didn't we? Did you consider it with your eyes? I did consider it with my <laughs> eyes. And your mind. My mind. Because that's what she wants you to do. My mind was blown. <laughs> your eyes deceived you. I left my mind. Sure? I left my mind inside the head. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I went up inside the mind of the head and there was nothing there. Just an empty space with a couple of chairs. <laughs> it's funny, the eyes were gone as well, wasn't it? Somebody's pinched the eye. The eyes are the windows to the soul, and someone pinched the eyes, so it was soulless. <laughs> There's some more ink caps. Let's see how they get their name. <laughs> Kilda Forest is England's largest forest. Of its approximate 250 square miles, about 190 square miles are trees, which are predominantly spruce. The rest of the area forms England's largest area of blanket bog. These here are Janus chairs that were designed by Ryder Architecture in 2009. Taking their inspiration from the unfolding petals of a flower, the three chairs are made using glue lamp construction technique and backed with stainless steel. Each chair is different size and each has a roof that extends over the occupant's head so that when the chairs are rotated towards each other, they overlap to form a partial shelter. The chairs can be orientated by visitors as they wish, towards the sun, away from the wind or rain, or together as a social group. They're quite stiff to move actually, but I've moved this one to shelter me from the wind and a little bit of rain. I think the rain stopped now, so time to get going. Next up are the salmon cubes created by Excite Architecture in 2009. They started life as part of the Tyne Salmon Trail, a sculpture project that was initiated by the Environment Agency to encourage more people to use and enjoy the River Tyne and to raise awareness of its healthy salmon population. The original project formed a travelling sculpture trail of 10 cubes, each depicting a different aspect of the Tyne Salmon. A family of cubes were designed to travel along the banks of the Tyne following the Tyne salmon themselves as they embark on their amazing journey from Kielder to the mouth of the Tyne and eventually back again over a period of a year. This cube is called Colours. It's inspired by the changing colours of the salmon throughout their life cycle. This one is known as Scales, inspired by the beauty and strength and agility of a salmon's armour. This one's known as Birth, inspired by the pea-sized orange eggs that the salmon lay in gravel beds. And this one is known as Reflection, inspired by myths and legends associated with salmon. This area here was once Plashet's Colliery. That's what it once looked like. So on the hillside behind me was a row of houses. So up there was once a row of houses. This embankment here, with that little tree on it. That's an old railway embankment, that. There would be a, a track on there, taking the coal down to the station, which is now under Kielder Reservoir. See if I can use my body to shelter the camera a bit from the spray. So underneath that lake over there, Neil gets out the way, before I push them in, <laughs> is Plashet Station that served the colliery. You can see across the lake there's quite a bit of weather. In fact, surrounded by weather at the moment. Plashet's mine opened in the 19th century. And although the Plasher scene was abandoned in 1935, the mine continued until 1964. So here's Robin's hut. 
the counter to Freya's hut on the other side of the lake where we went yesterday. So this is the inside of Robin's hut. It's not as elaborate as the other one. It's basically a half finished garden shed, isn't it? So we're going to stop here for some lunch. Um, it's not much of a shadow, but it's better than nothing. So that's us fed and watered. Time to go on. I'm leaving the half finished shed. Oh. <laughs> Another Greg's tuna sandwich with four pieces of cucumber. Yeah, that's not good, is it? Bunch of jelly babies. This here is Belvedere by Soft Room Architects. This is actually where we should have had lunch. Kielder Belvedere was Kielder's first architectural commission. The shelter was constructed from stainless steel that reflects the natural environment, causing the shelter to change its appearance in different weather conditions at different times of the day and as the seasons change. Externally, the structure is triangular and feels slightly ambiguous as you walk around it. It features curved panels and a panoramic window on side that faces the lake, giving the building the feel of a loudspeaker or an unlikely bird height. Seem to go on forever. Oh, let's have a look inside. Whoa. Yeah, this is the place to come for lunch. Lots of spiders, well. <laughs> Cool. I love a lot of spiders. <sighs> Internally, a circular room references the distant sky space, and the purpose of a long window becomes clear. When a visitor sits down and looks through the window, the upper and lower parts of the view are obscured, and the landscape is presented as a series of horizontal bands water, forest, and sky. Reminding us that Kilda's topography is not expressed vertically, but is an elevated rolling upland that reflected in the side panels seems to go on forever. Yep, land, water, and sky. It's a hell of a bad thing. <laughs> So we're inside Belvedere in Kielder and it's like being inside a 1960s architectural egg. The only thing is once you're in it's hard to find a door to get out. Like any of these panels feel like there could be a door. And we've been in here for about half an hour but we just can't find the way. Only for you. <laughs> <laughs> You'd think this is it wouldn't you but it's not. <laughs> yeah. No? But the thing is, it's actually on the ground. You've got to lift the little hatch up. <laughs> <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> Strictly no public access on the jetty. Didn't stop us last time, but honestly, this one's not as much fun as the other one. The like last one went right into the middle of the lake, while this one just cuts into an inlet. Not as much fun. It's raining like hell at the moment. So this one's called 55 slash 02 and it's created by 16 makers in 2009. Its name refers to the latitude and longitude of the site and highlights the importance of the building's location to its design, where key sight lines contribute to the unusual layout and seating orientates visitors towards particular views looking out onto the lake and smaller inlets nearby. 16 Makers is an experimental architectural practice with a particular interest in design through making, where the nature and properties of materials combine with the site's environmental conditions to inform their design process, eventually produce responsive architecture. Oh, okay, so yeah, it provides shelter from the wind, doesn't it, and rain. Good. Does it really affect the other one? That's the views. Walking around this inlet's a bit soul destroying. <laughs> Very nice though. 
probably be much nicer if the weather was better but this rain is pretty monotonous it's grey, damp <laughs> not the best walking conditions there you go, blanket bog they always get the weather forecast wrong in Northumberland every single time without fail just come prepared for the weather Sometimes it can be hot and sunny, other times it can be like this, hot and rainy. This here is the last piece of art trap we've come to see, and it's quite possibly the coolest, the best until last. Well, the head's pretty cool, like. Okay, so this is the structure. It's all dry stone walling, which is very cool. But that's not the best feature. Wait until I shut the door. I'm going to have to kill the light for this. The Wave Chamber is an intimate artwork by Chris Drury, built in 1996. It functions as a camera obscura, isolating a part of the experience of Kilder Water and Forest Park. The light reflecting off the waves beyond the belly and projecting it as if by magic on the floor. Just below those waves, there used to be a farm called the Belling. And there's a picture of what it was like. After the wave chamber, you'll see this sign which says Wild Walk. It heads up that way. That's where we go next. Behind me is Falstone Mine, or the remains of Falstone Mine. It was a level mine and it was worked until 1991. Still got some of the old tubs left. There's Kilda Ferry, named the Osprey after the birds on the lake. So, we're back at Kielder Dam. This marks the end of section 19. And it's blowing an absolute gale. We're in a proper storm here. So I'm gonna head into the car, out the way. Wow, what a storm out there. It completely disintegrated my umbrella. It survived the entire north side of the lake and then gets to the car park and it just disintegrated so it's in the bin luckily it was a cheap one from go outdoors so neil what did you think of that uh yeah it was really good this one really wild um exactly the weather i like like against the elements um on a path that i like where you're not too exposed you're in and out the trees it's like um i always think it's like jurassic park a little bit it's really cool i think i preferred the rougher north side of the lake to the um the, the southern side, although there's more cafes on the southern side. Um, but this was really primeval walking through there at the end. It was just really good. Uh, so yeah, I'd recommend anyone choose a stormy day and go through there. It's a, it's a great time, especially from the last maybe quarter is, is, is really good. Like forest walks, big ferns, big trees. Um, the wave hut was cool to see. Um, all in all, yeah, really. And a, a good sense of achievement at the end. It, it was been a long walk, the two days, um, but it, you, you you kind of feel like giving up some sometimes. But um, you really feel like you've achieved it at the end. So yeah, very good. And respect to the people that, that run around it all in one go. You know that's um, that's just crazy. But uh, if you can, that, that 
do that or get a bike if you want to do it in one because the, the bike looks like good fun too um, but certainly walking was great uh, over and out so that was cool the reservoir wow <laughs> to be honest the um, scenery I thought was better on the south side but the art was better on the north side um, the art gave like some points of interest which would have been a little bit more tedious if I hadn't been there so it gives something to do I think especially on the south side it's very good with children the north side is more adult it's, it's better art on the north side for adults while the south side is better for children um, it's a shame we didn't get to see the night skies because of the clouds um, but unfortunately you can't predict the weather can you certainly the BBC can't <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I've enjoyed the last two days um, I'm not sure how it's going to turn out on camera but it was actually quite a very good walk it's definitely worth doing on the next episode will be the last episode that we're doing on Time Valleys and its tributaries so the next episode will be the last episode that we use the current soundtrack I know some people will be pleased about that some people hopefully will be disappointed <laughs> Um, but please leave some comments below and let me know what kind of music that you like on these kind of videos because I'll be having to choose the music so the next video will have the same soundtrack as what we currently have after that we'll switch for another 20 episodes and then the last 20 episodes will switch again so if you like the video give me a thumbs up don't forget to leave a comment below especially tell me what kind of music you like uh, hit the subscribe button for the next adventure, share with your friends on social media, and catch you on the next one. The Northern Rave Fair Room. <laughs> you can have rave music. Digging through the closet, walled cities, past lives and boxes.